Welcome to A Padme Asks, where we ask questions with the aim of sparking interesting conversation about the world of technology. I'm Jake Sargent, Group Content Director at Padme, and the first question you might ask is, why are we doing this? Well, Padme is a digital product company, and we're fascinated by the role played by technology and digital platforms in people's lives. And the question that we're asking today is, is the ubiquity of technology consistently useful? Now you'll be glad to hear that it's not just me trying to answer that question. I'm joined by Alok Jar, who is our guest on a Padme Ask today. Um, Alok is science and technology correspondent of The Economist, works on the BBC, um, and also the author of The Water Book, which hopefully you'll see will become in, uh, of significance later on. But hi Alok, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So um, I guess I talked a little bit about saying that the question of, about, about ubiquity of technology We'll get into that in just a second, but there's three questions that we always like to ask our um, Apadme Ask guests, just to kind of set the scene a little bit and find out a little bit more about you. So the first one being, which app do you like using the most, whether that's personal or professional life? Yeah, I thought about this question and there's apps that I like using and apps that I actually do use. So the app that I like using the most, um, because I like listening to podcasts, is an app called Pocket Casts. I use it pretty much every day. It's the app I interact with the most. If, I, if you discount things like emails and all that kind of stuff, which I don't count. And I use it all the time to make playlists of podcasts and I'll be walking or in the gym or whatever else, doing washing up. And that's the one I'm almost always interacting with. That's the one I like using the most. The one I actually use the most is Twitter, and I don't like using it at all <laughs> because it basically is the biggest time suck in the world. And sometimes uh, I've got two small kids, and so you know I don't get much time to myself. But occasionally I'll be like, oh, I can't think of what to do. I'm just going to read Twitter for a minute, and then an hour later I'm still lying on my bed, or I'm standing half dressed at my wardrobe, still haven't quite finished doing. It's the most addictive thing. I kind of can't live without it, but I wouldn't say that it's my favourite thing to use. Yeah, and you're not alone in that either, are you? That sort of time sapping so. nature of it happens happens to all of us. I mean, I learn a lot from it, but I'm not saying it's a useful use of my no. time. Yeah, how much of what you're learning is useful as well, right? And, and I guess being immersed as you are in the world of uh, science and technology, is there any particular piece of technology that you find really useful or one that you can't necessarily live without? It could be hardware or, or software. Well, well, the smartphone is the obvious answer, right? Um, I mean, it got sort of crept up on us in the last decade. Um, I remember I've been a journalist for more than 20 years writing about the future. I've always written about the future, technology, uh, devices, medical things, and always it's something that's five years away, six years away, seven years away. And as soon as you've written about that thing, whether it's a new cure for cancer or whether it's you know um, a new way to launch rockets or something, I always used to write at the bottom of my article, this will happen in five years or 10 years. And then I sort of forgot about it and moved on to the next futuristic thing. At no, no point ever in my career writing about telephones, mobile technology, all that stuff, never wrote about smartphones and they just appeared and it was a surprise to me when it happened in like the late 2000s and I don't think I can imagine living without them now. Um, and then of course things like uh, laptops and things have become incredibly uh, ubiquitous in terms of you know you can use them anywhere. I don't think about it anymore like the fact that I can pick up my computer at home, take it to work and bring it back and it's the same computer used to be a real challenge you know, in the early days of my journalism where I'd go to an event or I'd go to a press conference and I'd think, how am I going to actually file this story? Um, I'm going to have to phone somebody and tell them over the phone yeah. or I'm going to have to find a computer to borrow in, in an internet cafe. Does anyone remember those? You know, it's just now, it's technology is so seamlessly embedded in all of it. And I think that that in itself, if you stand back to look at it, is quite remarkable. I mean, I can't live with that fact that my laptop moves with me everywhere. And it is my actual computer, it's not a borrowed computer or anything. But then you think about it, it's not really, there's no actual information on it anymore. It's all in the cloud. Yeah. Things like email, things like all my documents. If I lost that laptop 15 years ago, I would have been absolutely spare and didn't know, didn't know what to do. Now, I would just move to another computer, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be a problem at all. It's a bizarre situation, our relationship with it, that we, we sort of depend on it so much. It's so ubiquitous, it's so um, there in the background, um, but we don't realise it. I don't think anyone sits there and goes, oh, I couldn't live without my laptop. They just think, it's always going to be there, I'll find a way around it. And it's not until you don't have it that you realise quite how important it is. It's like when you arrive today, the first question, what's the Wi-Fi? How do you get, get connected again? Yeah, if you can't get connected, that's when you know, yeah. that's when you suddenly realise. And also, I suppose, when someone impersonates you online or steals your identity, which does happen more than all of us would like to admit, um, and you can't log into your email, or 
You log into your email, but they ask you for a second authentication somewhere else, but you don't have that piece of kit. Like, I do this with my mum all the time. She has lots of kit as well. To, and I, I've set it all up so it's all protected and she can't be catfished and all, or personal, her identity can't be stolen. But then the occasions when she forgets her password or doesn't know which device she has to authenticate on. And I'm on there on the phone going, you know, it's your, phone, your mobile phone, open this app, press this button. And she's like, what app? I don't know. Yeah. Why have you made it so complicated? And I'm like, well, it's because otherwise, what happened to you, if you, your friend a few years ago, they had thousands of pounds stolen. I'm making sure that's not happening to you. But once it goes wrong, you suddenly realize that if you don't have the now to understand it, then you know, you're know you absolutely screwed, aren't you? Absolutely, yeah. And, and that idea of kind of making life easier and being more connected, I guess, is inherently connected to your world of journalism and sharing information. And, and is there something that is particular that you see happening in that uh, space. You say you write a lot about the future, I guess, thinking less about the science and technology part, but more within your sphere of actually writing and sharing information. Well, from the beginning of my career as a reporter to now, uh, the job itself, which basically means finding stuff out from people, whoever that person is, uh, writing it down and then communicating it to a much larger audience, that's not changed but almost every other aspect of it has. Like how I do my job, where I go in to do my job, how I travel, how I communicate with my news desk at, uh, back, here, back at home, um, how I actually interview people, um, how, I, how that interview is then processed um, and, and used in terms of my content. For example, let me take you back 20 years ago. I might ring someone by the, on the phone. Uh, I might tape some of the conversation or take notes and turn that into an article, and then that's all done within the office. I was at The Guardian 20 years ago. I would be in the office. The systems there, the content management systems, only worked there. Uh, and they were buggy, they fell over all the time, and all sorts of problems, but we all sat there doing it. If we ever went out to report somewhere, maybe I'd go to a rocket launch, or you know, I'd go and interview someone in another country. It was a big project. I had to travel there, record everything, uh, do all my notes, and then come back and write it back on my computer at my desk in London. Whereas now, your office doesn't matter because your laptop's with you all the time. You can do everything that your computer used to do, whether it's recording interviews, transcribing those interviews sometimes as well, which has been a great benefit to me in the last few years. Honestly, one of the longest, most complicated and boring things is transcribing hour-long interviews yeah, yeah. and working out which bits you want to use because you can't be bothered doing all the shorthand or your hand gets tired and then typing its transcript out would take me days sometimes. Now you've got AIs that can do about a 70% good job uh, of that stuff. It's still not great, but it's, it's much better than it was. So, you know, it transcribes the interview, you can look at all the text, you can incorporate video into those things more easily, you can go back and look through archives of newspapers easily, I can Google information about that person much more easily rather than having to find stuff out through who's who's and books and stuff. You know, the information gathering is easier, the, where I do it is easier, and then typing it all out into an article, I can do that on any computer at home, in the airport, anywhere, and send it via email through my phone without having to worry about where am I going to get internet access to file this story, which is what I used to worry about all the time. Yeah, and, um, and increasingly it's everywhere now, isn't it? It's everywhere. It? It's weird if there isn't, right? You have to purposefully go to places without. Yeah. So it's completely transformed how I do my job. I suppose it means I can do things faster, which is not always a good thing. Uh, it means I can do things more easily. It means you can balance your life a bit more easily as well. You can be at home more with your family a bit more. Back in the olden days, it was like in the office and that's it. And then traveling all over the world at last minute, not seeing anyone. Now you can kind of integrate these things a bit more. Um, so if we, if we kind of bring that in then to this question of, uh, you know, is, is, the, is that ubiquity of technology always useful? I guess the idea for this came from the fact that uh, there's the famous Sam McCollery's quote about, you know, water, water everywhere, but not any, any drop to drink. And I suppose that was obviously re referencing sailors who were surrounded by sea, but didn't have any drinking water. Um, and and technology is kind of becoming a bit like, it's just part of the background, but can we always tap into it? And without that connection, clearly we can't. But I suppose that brings in the nice kind of link to some another area of focus for you, which is about this idea of water. And, and, and you've explored that a lot in your book, the water book that idea of it being ever present and a, and a constant within society. Technology is a bit kind of like that now anyway, isn't it? it it's sort of, it's permeated, not quite to the same extent, 
but it, it's kind of moving in that direction that you know people are starting to think well I can't live without it. Yeah the you, technology is ubiquitous um, but remember we're talking from a very privileged Western uh, relatively well-off society where that sort of thing is valued and we can afford these things uh, and even in our own society in England Wales and Scotland there are lots of people who can't have access to technology so for me Yes, technology is possible that it's everywhere, but actually access is a big issue when it comes to uh, low-income households and children, uh, children in those places that need to access educational resources. We saw this during the pandemic, of course, uh, that, you know, that yes, everyone can go home and do their work, including kids, but actually loads of kids don't have laptops at home or computers of any sort. Um, so that's a really important gateway, and I think that it should become a human right, really, mm -hmm. like water, yeah. to have access to the internet, to have access to cheap laptops, etc. So access is not universal. And then going globally, lots of the world has access to technology, um, and um, it might not be the technology we've got here, you know, full-on grade six Wi-Fi and 5G or whatever tech, mobile phones. But you don't need that. What you need is enough to send money, to gather information uh, about the situation around you, send messages, these things are enough. And actually a lot of the world does have that, but there's still plenty that doesn't. So it is ubiquitous. It can be um, incredibly useful, um, but let's not forget that there's still plenty of places that don't have access to this stuff. And is, in terms of that, that uh, link with, with water, what is it that first drew you to that as an area of, of particular interest? Um, to kind of lead you to, to that to that book that you, that you wrote and it, you know that kind of is it more about that the fact that it runs through everything and but it's also has a, a scientific interest too right yeah for me um, the interest in water is um, like any journalist what I'd like to do is find stories that are either completely new to the world which is why science and technology is something I find interesting because it's always new mm -hmm. or it's always been in front of you but you've not noticed it so water is one of those things, like we, um, we know what water is, all of us, and we use it all the time, but uh, you never you ever think about what it is, why we use it, or where it comes from. And you might have heard about the problems of um, the fact that the water is, you know, around the world, water resources are becoming more scarce through climate change. There's problems with, um, you know, entire crops in places not growing because the weather patterns are changing and stuff. That's all very important. But for me, I wanted to tell people what it is it's doing inside your body, why it is that water is important for you. It's 70% of you, but do you know what it does inside you? Where did that water come from? Almost all of it comes from the edge of the solar system, basically. It doesn't come from Earth itself. Um, you know, and also the fact that if you were looking for, one of my, one of my big passions in life is the hunt for extraterrestrial life. That is there life in space somewhere? And space is enormous. And we're finding all these ex extrasolar planets. Like there's thousands now. There could be trillions. And it just seems unimaginable that there isn't some other life somewhere. But if you're going to find life, then you need things to look for. And the one thing that connects all of life on Earth, every single life form, is water. And so water is this incredibly important thing that makes life function. You can't function life without water. And so we imagine scientists imagine that it would be the thing that makes other life function as well. So if, if there are aliens in the universe somewhere, you can, you can bet that they're using water. And that would be the only thing that, would be, that would ha we'd have in common with them. Um, because water is this bizarre, strange, quite difficult to understand molecule. We think of it as boring. You know, it's colourless, tasteless, doesn't do anything interesting. But actually, it's the most sophisticated molecule that we know of. Because it just doesn't follow most of the rules of normal chemistry. Um, and so that's what I wanted to write about, to, to make people realise this thing is much, much more intriguing and bizarre than you think. And you make that interesting point about it being one of the few elements where the actual scientific name for it has just entered yeah. normal parlance. In H2O. Terms of everybody just... Everyone knows what H2O is. Yeah. And I bet you don't know the chemical symbol for any other, <laughs> any other I don't think I do. Chemical. I was never a strong chemist anyway, but I, yeah. You know H2O though, right? Yeah, Everyone exactly. knows H2O. Yeah. And, and is there a... You mentioned the kind of the, the, the fact that it, it's everywhere, but it's also scarce, right? There's that constant sort of paradox, and we're, we're, it's so precious to us. Are there things that are happening that you think where technology is helping us with that preserve of this, you know, ultimate life form, effectively? So the paradox you raise is a really important one because the Earth is covered in water. If you look at it from space, you'd think it was just a big blob of water, or it's just the surface anyway. And there is a lot of water on this planet. 
but we can only really use 1% of it because the rest is salty. 1% is fresh water, we can use that because salty water does not allow life to function. Um, and that salty water, that fresh water, that 1% has been cycling around the earth for billions of years, making life function through clouds and lakes and all sorts of things. Um, and the problem is with climate change that rainfall patterns are changing around the world. Some places are becoming much wetter, like Manchester, uh, and some places are becoming much, much drier. The places that are becoming dry can't grow crops, they can't survive, the people can't survive there, so they, they move to other places. And that's the problem. Um, and so it's not that the water is literally running out in the world, it's the same amount, it's just in the wrong places. And the, if you think about the history of civilizations on Earth, every civilization on Earth that's grown up has grown up near water because they need it for food, for manufacturing, for washing, for everything. So if it doesn't appear anywhere near you, you can't survive. Cities wouldn't survive without it. So that's the problem. And the, but there are technological solutions. I mean, I don't want to get away from the fact that climate change is a massive issue. We've got other, there are serious concerns around that in terms of reducing emissions and stuff. Of course. But in terms of what we can do about it with other technology, well, there's a couple of ideas. So one is that I've told you about fresh water, so we need fresh water. Uh, but there's lots of seawater as well. So if you could take the salt out of it, then you could use that water for anything, for eating, drinking, manufacture. Um, and this is a process called desalination. It's a technology that's been around for decades. It's getting better and better now um, and cheaper because right now it uses a lot of energy and it's very expensive. So it doesn't really help you if you're somewhere very poor and you need water. It, they use it a lot in Gulf countries because there's literally no water there and they're very rich. So they can use desalination. We've got a few places in England that do it as well, but it's too expensive. So the technology challenge there is to make that cheaper and then suddenly a big problem goes away. Um, another very low-tech thing we can think about with water is A, becoming aware it exists. Now that's not the technology bit. Becoming aware it exists and that we're using it and B, using less of it. We just don't think about it. How many times do you flush the toilet? It uses nine litres of water. And you might do that four times a day, five times a day, using 50 litres of water. And it, through everything else you're doing, the clothes you're wearing, the food you're eating, the places you go, using multiple litres of water. And people in the West use thousands of litres of water a day. Well, you might be surprised by that, but that's how many we use. In poorer countries, they use a few hundred. Now, in the middle there somewhere is the optimal for everybody. We don't have to use that much water, we just do. We've just built our systems around it. These are not technologically advanced things, but I think technology is great, but you've also got to think about how your behavior changes to, in response to things too. You can't just expect technology to solve everything for you. And that's the thing, I think, that there, I think there's definitely something interesting in that idea of how technology could help to change behavior by giving you information that you don't necessarily have. So right, clearly the role of, say, uh, smart meters in homes has gone through the roof, right? But that really only conserves the other energies of electricity and gas, but most houses have water meters as well, right? But there's nothing yet that's allowing me to be able to go, well, actually, how much have I used today? And I boiled that kettle and I had that shower and I did that load of washing. Yeah. How much have I actually consumed? And what, what is my then target to try to bring that down? And I know that's something that water companies are keen to try to do to be able to reduce that wastage, but you have to feel like there's some kind of technology answer within that in terms of actually helping to change some of those things. Yeah, I think we've managed to gamify so much of our lives in a positive way, whether it's fitness, food, um, also energy. And I think that that kind of technology can be really helpful when it comes to resources in the world, which are running out or other people don't have. And it's cheaper than building some massive new bit of kit that extracts new water from the sea or something. Yeah. It's much easier, much cheaper, and then it changes your behavior. I mean, imagine, hopefully, our children and grandchildren will use a lot less water than we did. You can kind of forgive our parents' generation because they didn't quite, weren't quite aware of all these things. You know, the environmental movement started in the 1960s and people started to become aware, but it was boom time for everyone. That's why they all used all the fossil fuels, basically, it caused problems we have now. But now we do know, and now we can think about behaviour change, and I think that that's kind of an exciting next phase of how we use resources. Yeah, and you know, clearly, as you say, the the technology piece isn't the answer to everything, but it can certainly play a role in trying to educate, inform, Correct. give people a bit more information that then will hope to maybe lead to some of those changes. Well, uh, thank you very much. It's uh, been fascinating to talk to you. It feels like we could 
talk about that, that kind of link between the, um, the way technology is weaving into our lives and, uh, and water as well. But um, yeah, fascinating to talk to you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, just leaves me to say thank you very much to our viewers as well. Um, if you want any more information uh, about uh, a Padme um, or indeed uh, Alok's books, he's kindly involved in a, a panel session uh, that we're working on too, then there's more information on apadme.com and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much.